Part one, prologue. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys. Before we begin, for the purposes of clarity, here is the architecture of my family and when I was with whom. My mother Mary and my father John married in 1960 and set up home in Crumlin, Dublin, where they had been raised. Three years later, my brother Joe was born and they moved to middle-class Glenageary, far away on the other side of town. Then in 1965 came my sister Emer, then me 14 months later in 1966, then in 1968 my brother John. In 1975, my father sensibly left my mother for reasons this book will help you glean. He was given custody of us and we went to live with him and his new love, my lovely stepmother, Viola. But me and my little brother stayed only maybe six months because we missed our mother. At that point, I was nine. I stayed with my mother until I was 13 and then I went by choice back to live with my father. I was unable to adjust after what had been going on in my mother's house. So toward the end of my 13th year, I went to what is politely called a rehabilitation centre for girls with behavioural problems, in inverted commas. I think the whole world knows a refund is owed my father for that, as it clearly didn't work. At 15, I left the centre and went to a boarding school in Waterford. I joined a band that summer, and when I went back to school, I missed the band. So in December, after I turned 16, I ran away from the school, and I got myself a studio apartment, a bed sit, much to the horror of my poor father. He eventually agreed to let me stay once I agreed to remove the nose piercing I had also gotten. <laughs> he paid my rent, but none of my bills, so I had to get jobs. He's a genius. My father's second wife, Viola, has three daughters from a different marriage, so I have three stepsisters. Viola and my father also have one son, Owen, so he's my brother also. In 1985, my mother died in a car crash. I was 18. Later that year, after being invited by Ensign Records to sign a contract with them, I left for London. My first child was born when I was 20, three weeks before my first album was released. I have three other children, and so far, two grandchildren. The Piano It's Christmas and we're at my paternal grandma's house, the one that usually smells of cabbage. The house, not her. The lights around the tree mean the other downstairs lights are off. The grown-ups are in blue shadow with their backs to the parlour, concerned with one another, running all up and down the stairs. I'm little enough that they won't notice me if they don't look any lower than straight ahead. My grandma's parlour is verboten for me without adult supervision. The Christmas tree is in here. I got away with sneaking in to feel the presents, but something else is what I really want. Against the wall rests an old piano. The keys are yellow, like my granddad's teeth. There are echoes in the notes, a strange sound, like the ghost bells of a sunken ship. I sneak in here often by myself because the piano summons me. It makes the air around itself vibrate in huge waves with just the slightest suggestions of colours so as to catch my attention. When I play the notes, it sounds so sad. The thing is desolate. Once at dusk, I asked it why, and it answered, because I'm haunted. And it told me to put my ear against its underbelly, the flat panel of wood that's in front of your shins when you're playing. I press my right cheek against it, And the piano said, now play some notes. I played, stretching my left arm up so my face would stay where it was. Underneath the notes above, I heard lots of voices jumbled together, all whispering over one another. And I couldn't make out what they were saying. There were so many of them. I shot up and said, who are they? The piano answered, history. It said, they're stuck. They can't get out if no one plays me, and I can't breathe with them all in here. It said, I don't mind if you play me badly. I just need to be touched. Play me very softly, gently, gently, only barely, because I'm a very tender thing, 
and the ghosts are very sore. I said, you didn't tell me whose voices they are. It said it didn't want to tell me. I asked it why. It said, because of war. It said, a child shouldn't know about war. It said, people don't talk, so their feelings fly into musical things. It said, the ghosts are things that people don't want to remember. In my parents' house on Christmas Eve, we knelt before the crib in the hall to place the baby Jesus in the manger because he can't be there before midnight. And we sang all the songs that made me cry. My father had to help me off my knees and up the stairs to bed. I couldn't walk right because the Christmas songs were in my body. They bent and twisted me so I couldn't stand straight. My father understands about songs making me cry. He doesn't think it's weird. I'm always worried it means I'm weird, that songs make me cry and be crippled, and I'm only a child. He sings me scarlet ribbons when I'm all tucked in. His voice sounds very sad. He feels sad a lot, like me. Lovely ribbons, scarlet ribbons, scarlet ribbons for her hair. I'm mind blown by the song that there are such things as angels and that angels left ribbons and that children's prayers get answered and that the capo de tutti capi can outrank parents. But it isn't ribbons I want. I want songs to take me away to that other world. I don't like reality. I don't want to find myself back in it after three minutes and have to hang around in it until the next chance comes to have it vanish. My grandfathers. My father's father is a cabinet maker. He keeps canaries and homing pigeons in a wooden and wire mesh birdhouse he made that runs along the bottom of his garden. I really like him. He's plumpish compared to my mother's father, and he's a giggler, a smoky laugh he has. I used to wrap my whole hand around his index finger and drag him to the birdhouse so I could see him make pigeons fly off with messages in little barrels tied to their feet and then fly back to him empty-footed. Once he asked me would I like a fat bird to send a message for me, so I got him to write, Hello God, from Scamp. When I asked him, my granddad said Scamp is my nickname because a scamp is a rascal, a bold thing and I'm the boldest of all my mother's children. But he threw his head back and cackled smokily after he said it. Looked like a big child himself, his eyes got so happy. He likes me for being bold. Maybe he was the boldest of his mother's children. In the evenings, he and my grandma go out on their own together for a glass of porter because they're in love. I like seeing them go down the road when I'm swinging on their gate in the summer. They met on the same street, which was Francis Street in the Liberties, an inner city part of Dublin, historically a working class neighbourhood and home to Guinness and other breweries. But when my father was 12, his people had to move out of the Liberties to Crumlin, a more residential neighbourhood near the city centre. That's how come my father's parents live on the same street as my mother's parents, which is Keeper Road. So my parents met on the same street they grew up on, just like my father's parents did. My mother's father is a bread delivery man and he wears an old style black waistcoat with a pocket watch and a long black coat and black pants. He is very long and skinny, so all in all he looks like De Valera on a diet. His and my granny's house is like most of the houses of old people. There are worn out pictures of popes all over the wall and above the fireplace along with Padre Pio and Mary and Jesus. Halfway up the narrow stairs, there's a glowing red sacred heart lamp on the wall. It's really scary. No one wants to go up there when the other lights are off. My mother's dad doesn't like women who wear makeup, says they're Jezebels. His insults are usually biblical. Judas, he'll shout when so-and-so's name is mentioned, or creeping Jesus. The only thing he wants in life is quiet, but he can't say quiet properly because he's from Westmead. So he roars, quite, quite, at us over the top of his newspaper when we're being too noisy, which makes us giggle, so he has to roar it again. 
To make up for tormenting him, I stand behind his chair and rock him real softly in the evenings when it's just me and him so he can fall asleep. I make music in my head to the rhythm of the chair so that I keep my movements gentle and don't wake him. It goes one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, over and over. August 1977. Elvis is dead. I'm crying so fucking much I can't make my bed. My body won't work. I keep trying to throw the sheets across the bed, but I can't. My arms won't work. I try crawling across the bed with a corner in each hand, but I can't. My legs won't work. I'm in trouble with my mother because I haven't got the bed made. I'm too embarrassed to explain why I'm dripping snot and tears all over the clean sheets or why I keep falling on my knees and standing up again. I think she likes Elvis too. Figure she secretly knows why I'm a mess. She doesn't get very cross about the bed. She doesn't get cross at all, actually. She's most unusual. I need a new father now that Elvis is gone. My father isn't dead. I just ain't seen him for a very long time because my mother doesn't like him. In fact, they pretty much can't stand each other. It's scary when they're together. It's not much scary on our own with our dad, though, but she's different. I don't go looking for any father because I have God, and God sends me stuff because I talk to him. Naturally, he's the number one father, but I'm a kid. I need a father's voice, and poor God don't have a voice. I like voices for some reason. I don't know why. Sometimes people's voices make me want to cuddle them, but I'm really scared of cuddling. My body won't work if somebody tries to cuddle me. I like my Aunt Lily, and it hurts her feelings I won't cuddle her. I really want to, but I freeze, and in my head I see a mountain of wolves all covered in blood, so much that they can't move, and only one wolf is running about, the one who was at the very bottom of the pile, when whatever happened, happened, and it has no blood on it, and it's looking for help. I ain't seen my granny, my mom's mother, for a while either. She has a gentle, nice voice. She likes me. She says I'm honest and never to say sorry if I don't mean it. She lets me have everything I'm not supposed to have to eat. She can make me fall asleep by just gazing in my eyes when I'm tucked up in her bed. I like her clocks tick-tocking. It makes me hear music. Ain't seen her since I was maybe six. She came all the way from Keeper Road on all the buses with my birthday present. My mother wouldn't let her in. My granny cried and stood at the door looking at me sitting on the stairs. I was big-eyed scared. She begged my mother. She wanted to see me. She had on her tan coat. She gave the present to my mother. My mother said I could open it on the stairs and then Granny would have to leave. But she still couldn't come in the door out of the December cold. My Granny likes my birthday because it's a holy day as well and she loves God as much as she loves me. It was white pyjamas with tigers all over them. I loved them. I made my eyes smile at my granny because I knew I wasn't allowed to let my face smile. She did the same, but her face was tear-strewn. And like I said, I ain't seen her since. I started smoking properly because she does, and I like the smell of her. I pray a lot, like she told me. I love God, like she told me. I only ever ask for him to be with me. I come downstairs one morning after Elvis and I hear a kind man's voice singing to a girl that she needn't cry anymore. I go to the record player. I make my brother Joe play it again. I say, who's he? Bob Dylan. I see from the album cover he's as beautiful as if God blew a breath from Lebanon and it became a man. I'm not allowed to touch the record when my brother isn't home. I wait at the window every day because he has a summer job. I run out into the street and around the corner to watch for him. I never know when he's coming home. Things aren't safe at all when he's out. My mother doesn't like little girls. I like this Dylan man singing. In my head, I call him Lebanon man. He has an empty baby carrier hanging open across his chest. I slip myself in. His voice is like a blanket. He's really tender and he loves girls. And I have his chest to fall asleep on. So I've stopped knocking on doors around Glenageary, asking people if I can be their child. 
been doing that on and off since I was about six. They always only bring me home anyway, imagining my mother to be like other people's mothers. Dylan would never be deceived, though some of them did give me cheese balls and such. One family was having a Tupperware party when I knocked. The nice lady let me in because I was crying. She said she couldn't keep me, but I could stay for a while. So I chose to sit under the table because there were so many people. She gave me loads of food. I would have liked to stay with her. When she brought me home, my mother acted all nice at the door. Bob is a way better dad than Elvis anyway. That's what I thought about all the time her knee went into my stomach up against the wall. Lured. We just got back from Lured five days ago. Bit dramatic. Let's just say an episode was had by my mother, after which a priest was cajoled by me and dragged by the arm to come and help her, on account of that's the whole reason we went there. Well, it's the reason I went there. The others had to come because the trip was my requested confirmation present. Deal being, Jesus' mother might see about helping mine. I didn't tell anyone I was thinking in such a way. They just put it down to my being obsessed with the whole Lourdes thing because I've been reading about it for years. My granny told me about it because of my birthday and because my second name, Marie Bernard, is the same as the 19th century maiden who saw the Virgin Mary there. On the day before we were to leave Lourdes and return to Dublin, no cure had been found for my mother's madness, so I decided to go priest-catching at about 4 p.m., my chosen victim was dragged by his sleeves in protest of mine at his not being as eager as I was for him to go to work, ambling as he was along the Basilica gates in the sunshine with his newspaper. He relented at length because it was too much for him. I did the big eyes. I had him goggling at me like it was insane to believe miracles could happen in Lourdes, even though that's the whole deal his bosses employed him to sell. I had told my mother I was going for ice cream, so as I shoveled him up the road with one hand on his back and one still on his sleeve so he couldn't escape, I told him the bullshit story he was now to sell to my mother regarding how he met me, hoping he'd sell it better than he seemed capable of selling the lured story. So up he goes to her room. I sit in the little hotel lobby watching the pretty French ladies, trying really hard not to look pretty because they're in lured. He comes down after a while with his newspaper under his arm, his cowboy-looking black hat on his head, his green eyes watery-looking and fixed to the floor. As he brushes past my chair, he signals with his head that I'm to follow him out. There's nothing I can do for her, he says, and tells me I'm to pray until I'm 18 and could leave home, unless I'm able to leave any sooner. I'm thinking, oh, great, a hopeless priest. How the fuck did he get stationed here? See, I had a lured miracle of my own some years back. I had a veruca, a wart, on the left foot beside the little toe. Big painful thing with a black centre. It was like the girl who loves Anarchy Gordon in the old folk song. Its heart would not remove. So I was booked to go into hospital to have the veruca surgically removed. A thing of great glory, for it meant I'd be spoiled rotten for at least two days and have a ton of sympathy in everyone having to be exceedingly nice to me, not to mention I'd have a fair few days off school, and there'd be ice cream and jelly for certain at the hospital. The night before I was to go in, my mother took me into the bathroom and put some lured holy water that my granny had given her years back on my veruca. In the morning, the veruca was gone, utterly and completely vanished. No one would have guessed it had ever been there. There wasn't a trace of it. So I know Lourdes' miracles do happen, unlike my priest friend. We had gone to Lourdes via a travel agent, picked up at the airport by a tour bus. We drove with about 20 other people who were on our tour. We didn't just do Lourdes. We first went to a town called Nevers to see the convent where St. Bernadette lived and died after her visitations from Our Lady. They had her tiny body in a snow-white glass case on display, and people filed in there every day to see it, a grotesque tableau. It reminded me of the Dublin Zoo, where they had a crocodile in a glass enclosure, the exact length and width of its body so it couldn't move, with enough water to almost cover it while leaving its back exposed. At the top of the glass, there was a gap with the ceiling. 
The grown-ups would throw coins through the gap so they'd land on the crocodile's back to see if they could annoy it because it couldn't move. I wonder what the zoo people did with all the coins. Bernadette's body was dug up three times in the first 30 years after her death in 1879 so that people could take parts of her bones for altars. An altar isn't sacred, apparently, if it doesn't contain some part of the body of the dead saint. Sounds more devilish than godish to me. On the tour bus, we had a guide called Jay. He worked for our local travel agency back home, and he was very kind to me. He sat up front and he had a microphone for telling people what they'd see if they looked left or right or out the window. He started loads of sing-alongs, though, and my mother nominated me a bunch of times to sing Scarborough Fair, which I duly did with much feeling because I'd secretly fallen in love with Jay. I was sad when we all got back home because I missed seeing him every day. I'd been pining and singing the song all alone. Today I got sick of doing that and decided to walk the two or so miles down to the travel agency to declare my love and ask him to marry me. It was lunchtime when I got there, but Jay was sitting at his desk talking on the phone. My heart began pounding with fear. It had never occurred to me he might have a wife. Maybe he was talking to her. He finished his call and he saw me in the doorway. He beckoned with his hand for me to come in looking surprised that a child had made her way alone to arrange some possible trip through a travel agent. I said I needed to speak with him in private. So he brought me into a small kitchen, sat me at a little round table, poured me a glass of milk and asked me if I wanted some biscuits, but I couldn't eat because I was so sick with love. Not having the courage to speak and having prepared for this eventuality beforehand, I produced a written declaration. He read it, smiling the whole time, as sunlight shone through the open window onto his lovely brown stubble. And when he finished reading, he folded my letter carefully and asked me if he could keep it. He said it was the loveliest thing he had ever read, but that he was way too old to marry me or even be my boyfriend because he was 30, but that one day I would meet a boy of my own age and that would be better. He also said that he was the kind of man that loved other men. I never heard of such a thing before, so he had to explain a little. He said sometimes God just makes men who fall in love with men or women who fall in love with women. He asked would I mind keeping what he told me to myself because he said people didn't really agree with men loving men. He said people didn't often recognize what God loved and he said they sometimes didn't love what God loved. He told me I was never to believe any kind of love was wrong if it was true love and to always be brave enough to tell someone I loved them, because it was brave of me to have told him, and it had made him feel very happy. He said that if a grown-up ever behaved like a boyfriend with a child, then that was wrong, so as not to be telling grown men I loved them after today, because not all grown-up men were as safe as him. When he asked me why I loved him, I said it was because he was gentle. So he said, I'm to always make sure anyone I love is gentle. Then he said I could come and see him any time I liked for milk and biscuits and he was going to be my friend. So I wasn't upset because I made him smile and because he was so nice to me. I walked home very proud I'd been so brave and already imagining what my future boyfriend might be like. There's a boy called Gary who lives near me. He keeps asking me to go to the roller disco with him. I haven't asked my mother because she's very strict, but maybe I will. My Aunt Frances. She's 16 and I'm 6. She has Down syndrome. She lives all week in a care home on the Navan Road with the nuns because my granny and grandfather are too old to look after her properly. But she comes home every weekend and I love her. She's like a big walking heart. She loves everything and everyone. She hasn't any badness in her, only good. She's very dainty and ladylike. She has tiny hands like her sister, my mother, and she's the only person my mother adores. I'm often at my granny's when Frances comes home for the weekend. She takes my granddad's yellow suitcase-looking record player and drags me upstairs to her room and locks us in. She has a stack of records, all by the Irish pop singers Danny Doyle and Luke Kelly. Frances is in love with Danny Doyle. She'll say to me, Isn't he lovely? Isn't he lovely? in that funny way she has of talking through her nose. 
I have to agree he's lovely or she'll swat me softly across the head. But he isn't lovely at all. He has a beard and he looks like he drinks too much beer. She puts the record player on the bed and every time she plays an album, she makes me hold a cover and read out loud every word of what's written on the sleeve and labels back and front, inside and out. If I can't say a word, she helps me, pacing about the room like a school teacher. She makes me feel every millimetre of the record's packaging too, with my fingers and palms and even the size of my face. If I don't do it slowly and touch every millimetre, she swats me. She has lots of baby dolls, which she loves. She makes them dresses. My mother helps her because my mother was a dressmaker before she got married. But in Ireland, you can't work anymore if you're a married woman. Frances's favourite doll is called Brenda. But me and my sister accidentally broke Brenda, and Frances has not forgiven us. Every time she sees us, she says, "Use broke Brenda. And I understand how she feels because my cousin bit the beak off my favourite cuddly toy which is a penguin called Charlie that my father got me when he was away working somewhere. I don't like my cousin now, and I'm never going to speak to him again. Francis is a lot nicer than me. The train. I went back to school this week after three months off, and then I pretended to faint a bunch of times at my desk so the nuns would send me home again. They're so worried about me after what happened that I got away with mere Golden Globes-worthy performances. They didn't have to be Oscar-winning. Sweet! If I so much as blink too much, it seems like they would have sent me home. Usually I'm the bad girl, because I'm always stealing people's lunches, particularly peanut butter sandwiches, or shoplifting from the dress shop, or stealing money for the candy store from the teacher's handbags in the staff room. Sister Clotilde brings me to the chapel regularly to pray that the urge to steal will leave me. So far it hasn't worked, but that's because my mother likes me to steal. Mrs. Shields, who was a teacher, used to ask me if my mother made me do it, but I said no. She'd ask me where the welts on my legs came from, or about the massively swollen black eye I once had. She'd say, it's your mother, isn't it? But I'd deny it. If my mother found out I'd cull, she'd murder me. I felt bad lying to Mrs. Shields because she's lovely. I don't know why she likes me, but she does. I'd like to be her girl. I'd like to be going home with her every afternoon. She'd look like she was about to cry whenever I said it wasn't my mother. Her face would go all red and she would reach deep into her handbag and give me money for sweets and pat my face, all gentle like my granny does. I'm jealous when I see the other girls walking down Marion Avenue after school with their mother's arms around them. That's because I'm the kid crying in fear on the last day of term before the summer holidays. I have to pretend I lost my field hockey stick because I know my mother will hit me with it all summer if I bring it home. But she'll just use the carpet sweeper pole instead. She'll make me take off all my clothes and lie on the floor and open my legs and arms and let her hit me with the sweeping brush in my private parts. She makes me say I am nothing, over and over, and if I don't, she won't stop stomping on me. She says she wants to burst my womb. She makes me beg her for mercy. I won the prize in kindergarten for being able to curl up into the smallest ball, but my teacher never knew why I could do it so well. I love Jesus because he appeared in my head one night when my mother had me on the kitchen floor. I was naked and I had cereal and powdered coffee all over me. My mother was saying all this scary stuff, and I was curled up so she could kick me on my bottom. Suddenly there Jesus was in my mind, on a little stony hill on his cross. I never asked him to come, he just arrived. He had on a long white robe, and blood was flowing from his heart all the way down his robe, and down the hill and onto the ground, and then onto the kitchen floor and into my heart. He said he would give me back any blood my mother took and that his blood would make my heart strong. So I just focused on him. When my mother was finished with me, I lay on the floor until I knew she had closed her bedroom door. Then I tidied up all the stuff she'd thrown about and set the table for breakfast. Once the Holy Spirit came and sat with me too, though I didn't ask it to. It happened this way. There was a button missing off my dress, which used to be my sister's dress 
and we were supposed to go away for the weekend to my mother's friend's house. I got beaten up naked again, and my mother took the light bulb from my room and locked me in and went away with the others. When I'm frightened, I find bits of paper and write because I'm not allowed to say I'm angry with my mother. So I write, and then I tear the pages into tiny little pieces and eat them so she won't find them. This was on a Friday. When it got dark, I felt about my room until I found some paper and a pencil, and I wrote to God. I said, please help me. I was kneeling on the floor facing my bed, and then out the corner of my eye, I saw a small, white, very misty cloud come and sit to my left, a little behind me, and it stayed there all night. But the spirit didn't come back on any of the other days. I didn't eat anything all weekend, and I peed on the floor. When my mother got back, she was cross and hit me for that. And I had to go to hospital later that day because of a horrible pain in my stomach. And a nice young doctor said, this child hasn't eaten. My mother said I had eaten goulash, but I hadn't. She locked me in and went away another time before this. But in the night, my daddy came and broke the door down and took me to the doctor. I don't know how he knew I was there. He was upset when he saw all the dried blood on my face. We didn't say much in the car. She locked me under the stairs a lot too. When I'm home, I can hear Mrs. Shield's voice in my head calling my name. I hear Sister Clotilde too, just calling my name. I don't know if she likes me. I suppose she slightly does. She's just not a smiley person. She's the headmistress, so I guess she isn't allowed to smile. It must be so depressing being a nun. I'm really scared God will make me want to be one. I regularly pray that he won't although I have felt some calling to work for him because he's so good to me. The last time I heard Clotilde talking in my head at home, I'd been sent to bed during the daytime for saying Princess Anne was preggers. (laughs) I was really angry about getting sent to bed. Next thing I knew, there was Clotilde's voice. And as I happened to look at my closed bedroom door, the handle went fully down and the door opened, but no one was there. I went to the sitting room to ask my mother if she had opened the door. She said she hadn't been upstairs, so I don't know who opened the door. Maybe it really was Clotilde. Not long after this, I was standing in Black Rock Station with my sister after school, waiting for our train to Glenageary. A train passed through at full speed, and a blonde boy of about 14 in a grey school uniform opened the door on the racing train and it hit me on the right side of my head. I was bleeding so much that my grey school gabardine was soaked from shoulder to knee, but my sister and I just got on our own train when it came, got off at our stop, then walked up the long hill home about a mile. My mother was cross that I hadn't kept my ticket so she could sue the train people. The doctor came and put stitches in my head while I lay on the couch. I had very long hair. My hair was caked with blood by the time he was finished, but he said I wasn't to wash it for a month for some reason, so it got very smelly. He also said I was to sleep in my mother's room and she was to watch me in case I went unconscious. I had a nice time with her then. She made me a bed on the floor, and during the day when the others were at school, she taught me how to blanket stitch and made me banana milkshakes. That's why when I got back to school, I put on the fainting act, so she'd keep me home and love me. Lost in the music. I asked my mother's doctor to put her in the hospital because of what happened after my brother Joe ran away. She called the police, and they put out an APB, and he agreed to meet her near our house. She took me in the car with her. Joe got in and told her he wasn't ever coming home. She told him if he didn't, she would put me in the passenger seat of the car and drive into oncoming traffic in order to hurt me and force him to come back. He didn't believe her, and he got out of the car and walked away. Then she did it, put me in the passenger seat and deliberately smashed into a car that was coming the other way. Luckily, we were both okay, but I did scream at her. When we got home, I called her doctor, and he came and said that for our sakes, he would put her in the hospital. My siblings and I are banned from visiting my mother at the hospital. 
I'm glad because it means I don't have to tell her I've been fired from my job at the cafe. They found out I stole 54 pence, but they knew I'd been stealing money all along. I can't stop stealing. I got fired from the clothes shop for stealing skirts and cardigans for my mother. We all get summer and Easter jobs, mostly at restaurants. We lie about our age. We've been alone in the house for almost the entire summer now, without a soul checking in on us since they took her to the hospital. Not even the doctor. Nobody. We're having the time of our fucking little lives. I want to be a ballet dancer. I love ballet so much. I do nothing but draw pictures of feet in pink or red point shoes. I dance in point shoes, but I got into them too early. My teacher would be worried. It's really bad for your feet. But I love it so much I can't stop. I'm too shy to dance in front of people, but on my own I can do anything I want. My shoes are pink with satin ribbons, and I love them more than anything on earth. Me and my sister went to the Rotunda Hospital to ask for plaster of Paris to make a cast of the slippers, but the doctor told us people only have babies in the Rotunda, so they didn't have any. I love Margot Fontaine so much. She's so beautiful. I draw the firebird with colored pencils. I love Rudolf Nureyev. And when the two of them dance together, it's like they're one bird and it's a dove. My mother gave me a big book about Margot Fontaine for Christmas once. I go over the photos in pencil with tracing paper and then draw them on real paper and color them in with markers. But my ballet teacher said I can't have any more lessons until I get my back fixed. She said there are people who can fix it. It's been hunched and crooked all my life. I can't straighten my spine. She says it's worse since the train accident. She gave me a letter from my mother. When ballet music plays, the whole universe goes spinning around me like a circle of those whirling dervish men I saw on telly. Only they're whirling so fast I can't see them. All I can tell is that there are planets and space and some pinks and greens and light and dark blues and reds and sparkles. But they're the kind of colours you can see through. They're so misty. As I wrote as a kid, there's someone in the music too. It's not a person. Its hands reach out for mine. It isn't human. It's dark blue and green and made of space. It wants to put its arms around my waist. It wants to dance with me and whirl me by. It seems to know me, but I don't know why. I love disco music too, Sister Sledge and all that stuff. I've heard lots of songs on the radio in the car, and we always watch Top of the Pops. I love 5446 was my number. And I love the reggae song The Israelites too, and Uptown Top Rankin. I never heard any reggae except those three songs, and I love them. I wish I knew what Strictly Roots from Uptown Top Rankin means. I heard the impressions, too. They have a song called Fool For You, about a man who loves a woman who is mean to him. It's clever because they made the music sound like a fool flopping about the place. I also love David Bowie. I saw him as part of Mark Boland's show. I don't know what to think of Mark Boland because it seems like he's pretending to be someone. But David Bowie isn't pretending. He's not boring or square and singing like teachers tell everyone to sing. He has his own voice. Mark Bolan has someone else's voice. I think he doesn't like himself, because he wouldn't need someone else's voice if he liked his own. I saw another reggae man called Bob Marley on the telly. He had on a blue shirt, and he had really long hair all in sections. I was up really late. He was singing about stirring something up, but I didn't know what he meant. My brother Joe played me some music on Ireland's Radio Nova, Stairway to Heaven and Freebird. I love them, especially Freebird. I don't understand Stairway to Heaven because the singer says the lady buys the stairway, but you can't. Joe and I have been on the roof of the garage rocking out to Freebird and a song about husky dogs pissing in yellow snow. We pretend we're a band, and when the others aren't around, I get up there by myself and rock out to honky-tonk women. I just shake my long hair about all over my face like headbangers do. I love the Sex Pistols. I love Anarchy in the UK and Pretty Vacant and God Save the Queen. 
and I love the boomtown rats and stiff little fingers, all the screaming. I love that. In real life, you're not allowed to say you're angry, but in music, you can say anything. I love all the noisy electric guitars. My brother played me a Bob Dylan song called Idiot Wind. It's really angry, and he says loads of mean things to someone. It's really brave. He isn't pretending to be nice all the time. I found an old broken transistor radio in the garage a while back. I think it might be my grandfather's. I'm not sure, but it's really old. I took it all apart and put it back together, and it works. I don't even know how I did it. I sneak it under my pillow and listen real quietly at night. I like the song about sunshine on a cloudy day and the one about tears of a clown and the one called Just My Imagination. I like the Supremes as well and Ray Charles and Elvis Costello and Dire Straits. My mother always has on Ireland's national RTE radio. It's really boring and depressing. They never play happy music or talk about anything happy. It's all really sad songs, like the one about the art teacher who tells the boy that flowers always have to be red, or the one called Tears on the Telephone. They play the show bands too. Show bands are so horrible. They're Irish, but they play terrible covers of country and Western songs. And they wear horrible shiny outfits. They do really stupid dance songs like the ones by the Shadows. But mostly on RTE, it's all talk all day. Boring, stupid, sad or square stuff. Lots of stuff about the war up north too on the news. I'm really scared when I hear about bombs and fire and old people bleeding and everyone screaming and tanks and soldiers and people throwing things and even little kids watching in the streets. And that horrible Ian Paisley man in the priest suit screaming with his eyes all bulging. I'm sure he's the devil because my mother says the devil always dresses as a priest. I can't move when I see him on TV. I don't like it when he comes on and my father isn't there. Years ago when I was little, I had to get my father because I was watching Laurel and Hardy and Laurel went down the drain in the bath and I was really upset. I wished it could have been the Paisley man instead. RTE television plays the national anthem every night before closing down and we're all supposed to stand. There's a really miserable show on the radio, a lady named Frankie with a really deep croaky voice who reads letters from people who have bad boyfriends. Bad boyfriends are ones that don't ask their girlfriends to marry them or who want to have sex with them before they marry them. She also reads letters from men who are too shy to ask their girlfriends to marry them, and letters with stories of broken hearts and deaths or tragic losses. The station plays that miserable Marianne Faithful song constantly too, the one where she sings, Someday I'll Get Over You. My poor mother bought the record. If I ever hear it again, I'll lose my mind. She may get over my dad, but I'll never get over being subjected to such a terrible song. Same goes for Marianne's cover of Shel Silverstein's song, The Ballad of Lucy Jordan, about a woman going mad. I have a new job now in a nightclub because my mother's boyfriend told me a nightclub is a place where people go to dance to disco music and not the boring Irish dancing music that squares listen to. I'm 13, but I made myself up in loads of heavy foundation, blusher, mascara and lipstick, walk in and told the manager I was 16, and he believed me. So far, this is the greatest job of my life. I mean, I get to wear a white blouse with a nice black skirt. I stole the two of them from Dunn's, the big department store chain. My job is to give out the pink dinner tickets. The men aren't allowed to drink as soon as they come in. They have to have some dinner. So they first queue up for a numbered ticket from me. Then they queue for the food, usually it's some disgusting curry. Not at all like my mother's curry, which is the best thing you could ever eat. I love it because my face burns for ages after. I always chop the onions when she's making it because onions don't make me cry. The men are nice and I like how the place gets smoky and everyone is a little bit drunk. I like the disco lights, how they bounce around the room off the huge disco ball that hangs from the ceiling in the middle of the dance floor. I like how the smoke and the pillars on the dance floor make it so you can't really see anyone properly. 
I turn up for work an hour and a half before the place opens because the DJ said I could. He is always there early too, before me. He has to practice his set. So while he's doing that at full volume, he puts on the disco lights for me and the smoke machine and I change into my ballet shoes and my shiny blue stretchy disco pants that my mother would kill me for wearing because they're so tight. I stole them too. I have the floor to myself for a good half an hour with only me and the DJ there and I make him promise not to look. He's nice to me. He doesn't look. I know because I keep my eye on him. He ducks down behind his mixing desk and gets busy with his lists. Will you still love me tomorrow? Okay, I did a bad thing, but I didn't know it was bad, so it isn't a sin. That's what the Bible says anyway. If I were to do it again now, that I know it's a sin, it would be a sin. As long as I never do it again, I'm grand. I was sitting in pizza land with my friend, showing her a funny finger-pointy trick my father taught me years ago. A waiter thought I was calling him over. I wasn't, but it became apparent he thought I was flirting with him, and then he started flirting away with me. This was rather flattering because he was American and consequently gorgeous. Bleached, blonde, semi-dreadlocked hair and the cool accents. I'm only 14, but when he asked me what age I was, I said 18. I had on a ton of makeup, so he believed me. American men are cool. They're never squares. Irish men are total squares. There is nothing sexy about them. Me and my sister used to talk to all the Mormon men in town just because they were American, even though our mother told us not to. They looked so handsome, like movie stars in their suits. They worked in pairs, standing in the streets trying to convert Irish people. So sweet they thought such a thing could ever succeed. But all they were converting were teenage girls from lusting after teenage boys to lusting after grown men, particularly grown men in suits. Me and my sister told two of the Mormons we wanted to go to their house to talk about the Bible. It was only partly a lie because I do like to talk about the Bible. They made us popcorn, and sitting there with their jackets off and their white shirts revealed, they told us all about how being a Mormon is different to being a Catholic. I can't remember one word they actually said. I was fantasizing myself gloriously happily married to one of them, living on a farm with nothing to do at the end of the day's work, but talk about the scriptures and get naked and slide all over him in his suit. <laughs> anyway... This poor waiter, Paul was his name, flirted away with me thinking I was 18. I had never had sex before, so when he asked me to go to his flat in Smithfield with him, it never struck me it was sex he had in mind. Genuinely, I thought we'd kiss and stuff like people my age do, but not have sex. Once we'd been kissing for a while, though, it became apparent that the whole enchilada was required. I thought, well, I have to lose the virginity at some point. Most of my friends have done it. I wasn't cool at all because I hadn't. This was my big chance. I climbed into the bed with him, excited, even though I was also really nervous, delighted that my deflorist was to be an American. <laughs>